most fistula and incontinence. Fistula plagues the lives of thousands of Kenyans, especially women, every year, leaving them incontinent and ostracized by society. And joining us in studio is Dr. Boniface Muiru, who is a pharmacist by profession. He will be helping us talk in depth about this subject. Thank you very much for making the time to join us today. Um, let's begin with what is fistula? Thank you for the question. Fistula literally means an opening or a hole. So the f kind of fistula we are talking about, this is a hole that forms due to mostly difficult childbirth, mm -hmm. where you get the tissues around the birth canal dying, and it, the, the fistula may form into the bladder, that means you'll be leaking urine, and sometimes it forms into the rectum, where you'll be leaking both urine and feces. Mm -hmm. So fistula is a form of incontinence where you have a hole that is allowing your urine or your feces to come out uncontrollably. Right. All right. Now, uh, many of the victims of fistula are mostly women, especially those who go through obstructed labor or labor that goes unattended for a long period of hours. What can be done, uh, especially to women, to prevent infection in such a case? Actually, as you said, fistulas will happen to women, especially very difficult childbirth. Mm -hmm. That means there is the issue of accessing the healthcare facilities for you to have a normal delivery. So we are finding it more common, especially in the rural areas where the medical facilities are not near, or even in the hospitals where probably the, labor, the progress of labor is not monitored very well. So that one is happening. In fact, I'm very happy with what the government is doing, which offered free maternity care, mm -hmm. and even the build zero campaign clinics, because I believe with those kind of efforts, actually, in a few years' time, fistula will be a thing of the past in mm -hmm. Kenya. So access is the biggest issue right. to elimination of fistula. Okay, and even as we talk of access, what is the current situation with regard to statistics? How many people are suffering from fistula in the country? Probably, I, I, I may not have the exact statistics, but we, are, we have thousands actually, because the patients have been accumulating over time, mm -hmm. and especially in the rural areas, one thing I know that is happening is that we have some organization. The best treatment for fistula, the best treatment would be to prevent it, of course. But once it has happened, the best treatment is for you to repair that hole surgically. Mm -hmm. And we have some centers in Kenya which are doing a good job repairing the fistulas. We have Amlev, Dr. Kisa, who does a lot of repairs at very low cost. Even in Eldred, we have a gyno care center by Dr. Mabea, who is also doing the repair work for those people in the north. Mm -hmm. And even in most of the hospitals you'll have, we'll find we have gynecologists who have been specially trained to repair the fistulas. But as I said, repairing is surgical, it is expensive. So the best treatment for fistula is to prevent it like what the government is doing. Right, and so I will talk about the cost of fistula in just a bit, but other than hard labor and um, I mean, a, a tough labor process, what are other things that can cause fistula? What, what I would say is that fistula is more likely to happen to, let's say, a lady who is probably at age, she became pregnant, she cannot be able to access the medical facilities, most likely is associated with poverty. Her nutritional status will also be poor. That means her uterus, her, everything about her is not competent. Mm -hmm. So I would say those, those predispose to fistula. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the cause, as I said, is difficult childbirth where you find the tissues around the rectum or the bladder dying and you get an opening forming because the tissue dies. Right. And uh, do you think that there is... Um maybe a lack of information to the public with regard to fistula, because we have cultures that champion for early, ch um, early marriages, and so you find that these are girls well under the age of 18 getting married and being subjected to um, giving birth, and so in that case, they are prone to fistula. So do you think it's a lack of information or a cultural problem? I, I think it is both the information and the culture, because you find in some communities it's important for a lady to give birth at home, especially the firstborn. Mm -hmm. That means even if the reba is hayward, they still insist, where well, lazima well, uzari nyumbani. Yeah. Then in so many communities, you also have the traditional birth attendants. And some 
a few of them may not know this case now I need to refer to the nearest hospital. Mm -hmm. So information, culture, they are all playing a part. And maybe what we need to do is to kind of change some of the things that are predisposing us to the fistulas. Right. And um, another thing that I came across, uh, one of the causes of fistula is inflammation. And so sometimes uh, one can have a relatively easy childbirth, but there could have been um, a tear maybe during the childbirth childbirth process that wasn't arrested in time so can that with time turn into fistula yeah a tear big enough to cause the the fistula as i said the hole or the opening would be the case but in normal circumstances they will have tears and all that mm -hmm. during labor but for a competent person and with the right personnel those tears will heal mm -hmm. on their own all soon enough so that tear eventually becoming a fistula means some care was not delivered at the right time in the right place. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, we were speaking with you earlier and you mentioned that we even have cases of fistula among men, you know, although few. Tell us a bit about that. So for, for the men, I would imagine where you have a fistula opening into the rectum and maybe into the bladder where uncontrollably you leak the urine. It, it, it happens. Probably it's there rather than in women, and it's there, but not very common at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. right. especially those with rectal, what do you call, rectal sex. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things can happen. So those are things that can lead to fistula among men. Yes. Right. And so uh, we were talking about the cost of fistula earlier on. It's quite expensive. How much does it cost to get treatment for fistula in a public hospital? That's a good question. Well, let me start from a private hospital mm -hmm. to get a gynecologist and the theater. It could be anything above 50, 60,000. Mm -hmm. In a public hospital, probably the cost would be significantly lower, probably 5,000, 6,000, depending on the facilities. And sometimes do we have the facilities in the public hospital, do we have a trained gynecologist or surgeon who can do the repair? So there are all those issues, getting the right personnel, the right facilities. But otherwise, in itself, the surgical repair, I would say, it's not that complicated, but you need a trained person to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so then what would the, um, because we just mentioned that fistula will mostly affect the poor population, uh, because it comes mostly because of lack of access to, say, uh, proper health care and proper attendance. So what can this common person do to access fistula health care if it's that expensive? No, no, uh, as I said, we have AMLEV, which is doing the fistula repair campaigns and even once every year they have a camp in Kenyatta National Hospital mm -hmm. where they screen and they attend to those people. I said in Eldoret we also have a center that does that. So I would, I would recommend they talk to AMLEV to get access to those repairs. Okay. And AMLEV will do it at a subsidized cost if not free. If not free. Okay, yeah. so it can be free. Right, yes. now um, we will be getting to what you have for us here today, but uh, let's talk briefly about incontinence. You know, yes. if you could just explain that to us, what is incontinence? Incontinence, actually, it means loss of control. Mm -hmm. It uh, means we have two types of incontinence. We have urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence. And we say a person is incontinent when he has involuntary leakage of urine or feces. Mm -hmm. So the key word there is involuntary, without your control. So you could be leaking just a few drops of urine probably when you cough. You could also be leaking bigger gushes of urine or it could be the whole contents of your brother. Mm -hmm. But that loss of control is what we call incontinence. And as we say, there is fecal incontinence and urinary incontinence. When you, are, you cannot control your bowels, then we say you're also incontinent. Right. And I imagine that can be quite embarrassing. What are the causes of both the urinary and fecal incontinence? Actually, as you said, it's a very embarrassing situation for most people. That is even why fistula, which is a form of incontinence, is also people are ostracized, is a taboo issue. Mm -hmm. But what are the causes? First of all, as I said, incontinence is a medical condition meaning it's not a disease as such, but it's a medical condition. Some of the reasons which may make you more likely to be incontinent 
we start with age. The older you are, the more likely you are to suffer from incontinence. That is where you find, for example, men above 75 years of age, you may find up to 20% of them are likely to be incontinent. Then, if you are ready, you are two to three times more likely to suffer from incontinence than if you are a man. In fact, we say every fourth woman and every ninth man will suffer from incontinence at some point in their life. So being a red day means you are two to three times more likely than if you are a man to suffer from incontinence. Other factors that come in is pregnancy and childbirth. They tend to trigger incontinence. So if you are ready of childbearing age, again, incontinence will be more common. Again, at menopause, we tend to have many more people after menopause, many more readers getting incontinent mm -hmm. because there are some hormonal changes that take place during menopause. Estrogen production is different. You find tissue changes that happen. So that triggers also incontinence. Mm -hmm. Then for men, you find the incidence of incontinence is generally very low up to the age of around 50 years, mm -hmm. the so-called golden age where you have the prostate gland, which sits right at the neck of the bladder. It starts enlarging, it starts creating dribbling problems of incontinence. So again, the prostate and men's health is a big issue. And as we said, if you are obese, you're also more likely to be incontinent. And also, the, 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 we have so many diseases that in themselves can cause incontinence, like spinal cord injuries, mm -hmm. we have accidents, even stroke for men. So there are many factors that right. may trigger incontinence. Uh, but it, could there be a family history of incontinence as well? Family history, not so much associated with incontinence. Probably it could be a family history associated with prostate issues or those kind of things, but not incontinence per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now, before we get to how to treat uh, uh, incontinence, how do you prevent it? Is it preventable? For incontinence, one thing we need to assess the person and know why is he incontinent. Most cases of incontinence can be cured, and even those that cannot be cured, we have purpose-made products that enable the person who is incontinent to lead a near normal life. So. What, what kind of incontinence do you have? The most common type of incontinence is called stress urinary incontinence. Stress urinary incontinence is incontinence associated with exertion, like when you cough, when you sneeze, that kind of thing. And it has been found 90% of those people with stress urinary incontinence, it means the pelvic floor muscles are weak. Pelvic floor muscle is like the tap that opens and crosses mm -hmm. your bladder. Being weak, and being a muscle means you can exercise the muscle. And we call them Kegra exercises or pelvic floor muscle exercises. So it means if that is a kind of incontinence you have, you only need to know how to do Kegra exercises and you do them wrong enough, in that case, the, the incontinence will be cured. If the incontinence is being caused by, let's say, simple things like a urinary tract infection, again, you can treat the urinary tract infection. So the most important thing is to assess why are you having this medical condition? And then from there, the doctor will be able to know is this something we can treat? If it is an issue of an enlarged prostate, the urologist or the surgeons are able to remove it and then they tell you the kind of exercises you'll do. In that case, you'll cure the incontinence. Okay, yeah. uh, so those are good tips on how to prevent it and how to treat it, but while you are going through that, you know, that period of incontinence, whether uh, urinary or fecal, how do you manage it? How do you ensure that um, you're not going out there, you know, smelling a certain kind of way that's quite repulsive? What do you do? Actually, in fact, that, that is the biggest issue with incontinence. People are embarrassed even to seek help. Even our health care providers, they don't ask about the problem because the solutions are not so many. And we want everybody to read a normal life. So what happens is that we have various groups of purpose-made products mm -hmm. that are specially designed to help people who have incontinence. Mm -hmm. And from what we call adult briefs, adult briefs are what we call the adult diapers, mm -hmm. where you just put on like a diaper, but they are for adults. And those ones, they are specially designed to absorb huge quantities of urine and they are friendly to the skin. 
So you just use it like everybody else as you seek for your treatment. And then because we know incontinence is a topic of taboo, they have also come up with pants. Pants are purpose made to absorb huge quantities of urine, mm -hmm. but they are worn just like the underwear. And everybody who is incontinent at least has used an underwear. So you just put it on, and then if you, are, if you have decided to put on your dress or your bui bui or your trouser, you put it on, and it is thin enough for nobody to notice it, and it is able to absorb up to 1.2 liters of urine. With right urinary incontinence, we have a range of purpose-made products by the name of Tenaridi. They're able to absorb huge quantities of urine very fast and leave you dry. Because most of the ladies who reek urine when they sneeze or they cough, what they've been using are the sanitary towels. Mm -hmm. But the sanitary towels are meant for blood. They're not meant for urine. So they keep, you need to keep changing them very often. And then you also smell because they're not meant for that. So the right product for ladies with right urine incontinence is tender day, which are found of various range. And then right. for no, j just before we move on, yeah. uh, do these absorb the smell as well? The, the pants and the diapers? Yes, we, we, it's, it's also a good question because what happens? Why, why do, do people smell? Those people who are urinating, why are the toilet smelling? What happens is that the urine or the feces are byproducts of the body. They contain urea. Urea is the one when it mixes with the bacteria in the environment, it produces ammonia, and which is the main gas why we smell. So the purpose-made products are made in such a way that where the urine goes, the pH, the pH is the acidity of the place. Mm -hmm. It's so raw such that there's no bacteria that can survive there. So automatically when the urine goes there, smell, there is no bacteria to meet to form the ammonia that causes the smell. So you find the purpose-made products, especially Tenere Day and Tenamen, and even the Tenapan, they have been made, designed in such a way that smell has been completely taken care of. Because one of the embarrassing things about people with incontinence is smelling. Mm -hmm. And the Tenere Day, the Tenamen, and the Tena products that we have, the purpose-made products for incontinence, they have specially taken care of the issue of smell. Okay. So as I was saying, we also have a pad for men who are dribbling urine. We said at that golden age, the 70s, the 50s and above, you find men are dribbling urine because of their prostate issues or other issues. And one thing, well, it's a big taboo problem of incontinence with radius. In men, it's even worse. So what happens is that those men are at that golden age where they're setting off their daughters, you'll find they don't even want to attend their social functions mm -hmm. because they are smelling and they are dribbling urine. So we have a special purpose-made product for men with right urine incontinence, it's called Tenamen. And these products, fortunately, are available in most of our supermarkets, in most of the chemists, and in many of the hospitals. And they allow people with incontinence to live life mm -hmm. without worrying about bladder leakage. Right, and the, are they uh, cost effective, are they affordable? Affordability is always a big issue, but they are, they are the best value for money. I would say, for example, when you talk about the adult briefs, the tenor slip, you'll find a piece cost about 85 shillings, that is for a medium person, and a pack has 10 pieces. We have a pack of two pieces, pack of 10 pieces, and 30 pieces. Mm -hmm. The tenor pants, for example, medium, most people are either medium or large, you'll find the whole pack of 10 costs about 970 shillings. The tenor red day, they come from ultra mini, mini, normal, and extra, depending on how much urine the red day is leaking. All the packs, they all retail at the same price in the supermarkets, wow. which is 395 shillings. Okay, so these are all products specifically made for fistula victims. These are all products specifically made for people with incontinence. Mm -hmm. It could be the fistula cephalus. And you'll also discover most people with incontinence, it's not fistula. It could be age-related, it mm -hmm. could be menopause-related, and all that. So these are purpose-made products for people with incontinence. All right. So the hope here is that uh, both fistula and incontinence can be prevented. Both fistula and incontinence can also be treated. And so it's not that one is being condemned to living, you know, um, uncomfortably their whole lives. Yes, you have put it correctly. Fistula, 
and incontinence, many of the cases can be prevented. And even if for bad luck you have it, you need to read a normal life. We, you don't need to be hiding out there. You don't need to be ostracized. You don't need to be embarrassed. Right. Something can be done about your problem. Okay. And, and uh, as we wrap up, Dr. Boniface, let's talk about pain. Is fistula painful? Uh, uh, I would imagine during the initial stages where the fistula is forming, there should be a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But like every other situation, once the fistula has healed, probably the pain will be manageable or much, much less. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. That is Dr. Boniface Muriu, a pharmacist, helping us to discuss the issue of fistula and incontinence in the country. And so if you are dealing with incontinence or fistula, there are products out there that will enable you to live a comfortable life. And fistula is not um, a lifelong sentence. You can prevent it and you can also uh, get help from it. He just told us that AMREF are carrying out campaigns that you can even have um, the surgery, the fistula uh, surgery for free uh, through AMREF. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Boniface Muriu in studio today. And that brings us to the end of Weekend Express. Thank you very much for joining us. Do join me tomorrow, same time, same place for an interesting bulletin. My name is Michelle Ngele.